you. Chatty Kathy. All right, here we go. Go ahead and get signed in, please. Oh, there's Kaden. Okay. And here we go. So I'm going to try and remember to do things in order this period. And the first thing, of course, is talking about what we're doing. So uh, last night when I was um, setting up the calendar, I know I want to do a lab with you guys next week, but I wasn't, couldn't decide until this morning which one I wanted to do. So I just put free lab. You'll see that in your uh, classroom feed. I want to go over the ozone, ozone depletion homework with you. Um, and then we're going to talk about metallic bonds and alloys. And there's a really uh, current event um, that might, uh, uh, you might have heard of where a uh, United Airlines uh, jet engine fan blade broke off and uh, kind of trashed the, the plane. There's everybody managed to land fine. Federal regulations are good because that airplane could fly with one engine, but we'll talk more about that uh, later. Okay. All right. So that's where we're going. Let's talk about your uh, ozone depletion homework. See what you got for answers. So go ahead and pull that up. Um, you can look at them, right? Even though you submitted it. Okay. So if you would do that for me, please. Oh, I know what I was gonna try and do. I was gonna try and use my phone to sign into this Google Meet and see if I can see comments any better. So I need that. Um, If I can, sorry. <sighs> Says I'm on the Wi Fi, but it's not letting me join. Oh, well, it was worth a try. Okay, uh, so what did you find out about ozone? We should have learned quite a bit about it, but those of you here in the classroom, <laughs> good, dude. Uh, hopefully you uh, know. Dude, what layer is the ozone found in? Perfect. What's the importance of ozone in the upper atmosphere? Ben. Oh, thank you. Block UV light. Well, same same thing. Yeah, it's not nuclear radiation, so um, it, it's confusing because we use radiation for electromagnetic radiation, and there are some things that are ionizing. Ultraviolet light is the beginning the, of ionizing radiation. So, but it's not uh, nuclear like uranium and that kind of stuff. Okay, what? Uh, let's pick somebody else. Uh, uh, Zachary, tell me what chemical will destroy ozone. CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, good job. Where do we find CFCs in, uh, in our experiences? Nadia, where do we find chlorofluorocarbons? Where are they? Oh, well, so it's made of chlorine, carbon, and fluorine, but where are these chemicals? Where are these compounds? You know, think aerosol cans. So it's a propellant for a lot of aerosol cans. It's a solvent. Where else is it found, um, Logan? Yeah. So that was a surprise, right? Fire suppression systems may have CFCs. Again, as a propellant, it's it's helping shove it out. Um, if you want to get a fire put out. Um, how about Brooke? Is fine. Re refrigerants. Absolutely. So your refrigerator, your freezer. Um, air conditioners in your car, air conditioners in your homes, and there's also one other one. You have one, Ben? 
Okay, refrigerants are good. So also in foams, so like the puff up foam stuff, like foam insulation, um, it's used to expand styrofoam, it's used to ex uh, expand um, seat cushions, um, and um, that is another uh, source of them. So there are a lot of them, and they're in a lot of different things that might surprise you. Again, we thought they were harmless. <laughs> didn't seem to hurt life on earth, but um, until it got up into the stratosphere, I guess. So what's going, uh, what's going on in the diagram? Anybody? So CFC have apparently that breaks off easier. And so chlorine breaks off um, in the cold temperatures of the upper stratosphere. And again, that's kind of, you know, remember it said, oh, it starts to warm up. Warm is a relative thing, right? It's just talking about the speed of the molecule. So the chlorine breaks off and then um, can attach to ozone briefly, um, pulling off one of the oxygens from the ozone. And then it releases that oxygen too. So it ends up, busting up thousands, one chlorine ion or atom can break up thousands of ozone molecules over and over again before it finally stops and binds with something else. Uh, what's some problems with having a thin ozone layer? Health problems, any kind of problems? Yes, no. um, sorry. Skin cancers, okay, ultraviolet radiation is gonna cause ionization and damage your DNA and cause, uh, you know, the skin cells that are re reproducing problems. What else? Uh, the other ones? <laughs> yeah, so there's any kind of, um, you know, alteration of your DNA, it's gonna happen to plants as well. So there's probably something going on there. Um, there seems to be a link to climate change, in this, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. I mentioned uh, that yesterday. I'm not sure if I said it in this period. Um, cataracts, so damage to your eyeballs is caused by uh, ultraviolet radiation. So if more ultraviolet radiation is hitting the surface, more people are gonna have uh, cataracts and worse ones. And yeah, those are the main um, things that I come up with. Anybody come up with anything else? All right, uh, the um, Montreal Protocol was an international agreement. It's a way that, um, you know, we, this is just like a textbook example of people working together. We find a problem in the first couple years of the 80s, we diagnose the problem, we find out what caused it in the next couple years, and then just a couple years later, we make an international treaty globally to phase out the use of CFCs, starting with the most industrialized, um, usually the richest uh, countries. So um, we tried to set standards to phase them out, and then the um, poor countries, the least less industrialized countries, um, were given a little bit more leeway. So has it worked? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, it's going to take another, like they said on the video, another 50 years to find out for sure if we can get back to that baseline in 1979. Um, it's up and down, and that's partially because of, like, in 2019, the increase in temperature in September. Um, we don't, we certainly aren't out of the woods yet. Um, we think it's getting better, hopefully. Um, it, you'll see that in your lifetimes that it does uh, work out. So uh, the current state of the ozone layer, I shared that with you yesterday, it has about half the density and about uh, uh, that it should. So 225, I think, and we're at 103, less than half the density it should be at in Dobson units. And then um, it's also almost as big as it's ever been in 2020. So maybe it's not working yet. Um, there's also some concern that some countries aren't being honest and aren't following the protocol like they said they were going to. So we'll see. And then the last question, anybody know why we're talking about this in chemistry? 
what was the topic that I linked it to? You guys remember from yesterday's talk? Resonance. Resonance. What's that mean? Uh, anybody? You're killing me. Is this the right way to diagram an oxygen an ozone molecule? Everybody's got an octet, right? Is that the right way to do it? Could be. Okay, except this would indicate what? What do two lines mean? Sorry, you can't see over my computer. I'm trying to make it so they can see. <laughs> two lines in a, in a structure, what does that mean? <sighs> Come on, you guys, what's two lines mean between two atoms? Thank you, a double bond. So is there really a double bond between I'll just do it this way and make it simple and leave off some of the dots. Is there really, what should happen if there's a double bond compared to a single bond? Yes. So a single bond will be easier to break than a double bond. What do we know about ozone? The bonds are equal. They're equal and they're not super strong, but they're equal in strength. So remember that little video clip that where the guy showed like a dash line, two dash lines, like a, it's one and a half. It's not really two and one, okay? It's like one and a half and one and a half, okay? And so the ozone, you would have to draw a secondary structure because you can actually number the atoms and you could draw it with a single bond between one and two and a double bond between two and three. So those are what resonance structures are. Based on our dot diagrams on paper, the Lewis dot octets are satisfied, but real life says, no, that's not a double bond. It's not any different in strength than a single bond, okay? So that's why we, uh, I put it out to you because it's an environmental issue. It's a concern for our planet, but also to, tie it into why understanding resonance is important. All right, you can put those away. And then I have a, a note sheet for um, talking about metals and alloys. Um, it is not uh, terribly, uh, what do I wanna say? It's not super duper um, full of pictures or anything, but it gives you some of the main topics. So again, we're going back to chapter seven and um, because I want to be able to do labs with you on uh, metallic bonding. So I dropped it and I knew I was coming back and I wanted to have that time with you um, to make it uh, more seamless. So we're gonna talk about uh, metallic bonding and metallic properties. We'll talk a little bit about alloys and why they're important today. And then on Thursday, I'll do some demos as well and talk about our lab and safety and lighting burners. We get to use our butts and burners. Woo -woo. Right. So let's see if I can find my PowerPoint. Um, you have seen metal all your life. Most people, a lot of people, I think, don't understand um, that steel is, we understand it's a metal, but what's the main metal in steel? Anybody know? Iron, good. And so there's different kinds of iron, and hopefully um, you're aware of that. But when you hear steel, um, high carbon steel, low carbon steel, uh, stainless steel, uh, raw iron, they're all based off of the element iron. And so um, we've used, you've got metals all around you and probably the only metal that you encounter on a regular basis that's pure is aluminum. All the others are mixtures and we'll talk about that. 
So metallic bonding, we talked about ionic bonding, we talked about covalent bonding. So ionic, right, they're exchanging electrons, transferring electrons, covalent, they're sharing. With metallic bonding, they're kind of sharing, but it's different. So the book puts metallic bonding right after ionic bonding, and that's appropriate, as you'll see on the video, because they're kind of similar, um, but there's an important difference. And that important difference is the metals cations are swimming, if you will, in a sea of electrons. So you guys know that metals lose electrons, you know they form cations, you know that um, when they make an ionic compound. However, when they just exist with each other, other metal atoms, there's just all these loose electrons. So those valence electrons um, are what we call delocalized. They don't hang out with one cation. They're free to move around. And that's what gives metals a lot of their really important um, properties, their ductility, their malleability, their conductivity, whether it's electricity or heat, is all about those electrons being able to move. And um, this picture um, shows uh, a representation of magnesium atoms. So you guys know that magnesium is element 12. Um, that means it has 12 protons. Right? And it should have 12 electrons. However, it's also in group two, and so it's going to lose two electrons and form a cation. And those two electrons don't leave when you have pure magnesium, they don't leave anywhere. They're around all these metallic cations. Okay? So remember, 12 protons, if you only have 10 electrons around you, you're going to have a plus two charge. That's the ion core, right, the cation of magnesium, and then all this blue area is supposed to be the sea of electrons from all of the magnesium atoms. So a metallic bond is just simply that electrostatic force. It's a lot like an ionic bond, you know, where they're attracted to each other, like in our salt crystal, but they're, it's just slightly different, okay? Um, if you hammer on a piece of metal, you guys know, um, it usually, it shouldn't break, although um, if you treat it a certain way, as we'll find out with our bobby pins next week, um, you can make it break, which is really bizarre, but we'll find out why that is. Um, the same kind of force, so these cations just kind of slip slide through all the electrons, okay? In an ionic compound, you have distinct little units no, I, no electrons in between. Um, one's got the electrons, one doesn't have the electrons, the anions and cations, respectively. So if you apply a force to an ionic compound like table salt, okay, you will orient anions next to each other, cations next to each other, like charges repel, so they're gonna force themselves apart from each other and shatter. Metals are ductile. So you can shape them into wires. They're malleable. You can hammer them into pots and pans and bracelets and jewelry and all that kind of stuff. Um, the metal um, is actually like pounded through a die, through a little opening to get your different gauges of wire. Some of you have done some wire work, I imagine, over your years. And of course, you know they conduct heat and electricity well. And actually that con conduction is due to the fact that the electrons kind of move along, okay? Because the electrons aren't um, staying right next to their cation, and they can move along through the metal, through the wire, and pop out, not the same one. So if I want to run electric current, I hook it up to one end and put a light bulb on the other end of my cord, and the electricity is going to knock electrons all the way through and then whoop, out the end to light up your light bulb. It's not going to be the same electron that went in that comes out to your light bulb at that moment, but that's kind of what's going on. They're just moving through. All right, let's uh, look at this. I think I have it pulled up. And some of you will find this easier to see. Animations. Help. Oh, I meant to show you this one first. Oh, well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. 
Metals are used in many everyday objects. This morning, when I woke up, I decided to have a soft boiled egg and a cup of coffee. The pot I use is made of metal. The kettle is made of plastic, but the coil heating element inside it is made of metal. Metals are good conductors of heat. This is the reason why metals are used to make these everyday objects. You would never see a pot made of wood or a heating element made of plastic. Metals are also good conductors of electricity. The wire connecting your kettle to the electrical socket is actually made of many copper wires, insulated with a layer of rubber. Think about the shapes of the everyday objects we describe. The pot, the heating element inside the kettle, and the copper wires. Notice that they are very different. Metals are malleable. This means that they can be molded into different shapes. Metals are very ductile. This means that they can be stretched into wires. To fully understand these properties of metals, we must understand metallic bonding. When we talk about metallic bonding, we are actually describing the electrostatic attraction between the metal ions arranged in a lattice structure and the free floating electrons around them. Since these electrons are free to move around, the term sea of electrons is also used. What is a lattice structure? And where have you heard this term before? Let's pause the lesson to think about this and resume when you are done. The term lattice structure means that there is a regular repeating pattern. We have heard this term before when discussing ionic lattices. It is used to describe the alternating positions of the metal and non-metal ions. In metallic structures, however, there are only metal ions. These metal ions are arranged side by side in a regular repeating pattern. So that should bother you, I guess, or bother me, to think about a metal being a crystal. It's like, what? This is what a crystal is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be sparkly and transparent and pretty. Um, all it means to a chemist, a material science chemist, is that there's a repeating pattern. Can you see the repeating pattern of the atoms? Of course not. Or the ions? Of course not. Okay. We can see it, though, with um, there's heat imagery, thermal imagery. There's acoustic imagery. There's x-ray crystallography. That's a big one. Um, so we can see that pattern. So even though, you know, how can a metal be a crystal? It just means that there's a repeating order to it, okay? Free floating electrons. Oh, and that's the other thing. Um, the, the electrons they show on here are going in a circle. Electrons don't go in a circular orbit, okay? They're just randomly moving around. But obviously it's hard to probably animate that. So it will give them the benefit of the doubt that you know they're doing the best they can and again they're not just all moving in one direction uniformly even when electricity is pushing through um, they're still going random every which way in general the bulk of it's going one way but not always like a glue and hold the structure in place this is a very strong attraction and explains why metals have high melting and boiling points a lot of heat energy is needed to overcome this attraction. This is also why metals are very good conductors of heat. Free floating electrons are the reason why metals can conduct electricity. Metals are malleable and ductile because no matter what shape the metal takes, the free floating electrons will conform to that shape. The strong electrostatic attraction will remain and therefore the structure stays intact. Let's think about it. Cars and bicycles, trains, planes, buildings, cutlery, spectacles, furniture, and endless items can be made from metals. To recap, the electrostatic attraction between metal ions arranged in a lattice structure and free floating electrons is known as metallic bonding. This explains many properties of metals 
They are good conductors of heat and electricity, have high melting and boiling points, and are malleable and ductile. Questions on any of that? Hopefully the animation helped some of you. One, one. Hang on. Make sure somewhere. There we are. Okay, just a couple more things, and then we'll talk um, about homework. So again, crystals <laughs> it doesn't have to be sparkly and pretty. It just has to be a repeating pattern. So um, they use all sorts of bizarre things in this book to represent it. But you can see that this is a hexagon, right? And there's one tomato or whatever the heck that is in the middle. Okay, that's also kind of how zinc organizes, believe it or not. Um, I'm going backwards, sorry about that. So there are multiple different ways, and we're just going to look at a couple of them, and it's not like we're going to do tons of material science. That could be a whole other year-long class easily, um, but it's a super important um, topic because knowing how to build things out of the right kind of materials for the situation that material is going to be encountering is super important. Like jet engine fan blades. <laughs> All right, so chromium is an example of an element. It's a transition element, and it's pretty hard. And you're going to hear tomorrow the reason why uh, transition metals uh, tend to be harder is because they tend to have more uh, valence electrons released in their sea of electrons, and that holds those cations together. But chrome and uh, chromium and molybdenum, chrome moly, you might have heard that for uh, wheels and stuff on cars. Um, it's a pretty uh, strong combination, those two, and they're actually in the same family, which is kind of cool, or same column. They're all transitional. Anyway, one arrangement is what's called body-centered cubic, where there's a cube, right? Six faces on a cube, each corner, there's eight corners, and there's one in the middle. I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, gold super soft metal, okay? very high density, big atoms, um, forms in what's called a face-centered cubic. So, you know, there's six faces on a cube, and there's a gold atom at the center of each of those face planes, and then there's one at each of the eight corners. And this one was the one that the tomatoes or whatever they were showing um, is hexagonal closest packing. So, and you'll see that on the uh, last video we're gonna watch. Um, there's a hexagon, six sides, six pieces. And then there's one in the middle and then they kind of overlap hexagons, if you will. So this, uh, this is obviously a hexagon. This is a hexagon. And then this little half in the middle is like a layer uh, underneath it. Okay in between it sandwiched. And so that's for zinc. I'm not gonna expect you to know what element has what kind of packing. I don't know other than these three examples, okay? Um, this definition you do have to know, and it's one of your homework assignment questions, and that is what's the definition of an alloy? And an alloy is a mixture, a homogeneous mixture, where at least one of the components is a metal. So what's homogeneous? We did this a long time ago. What's homogeneous? And you should know this from like homozygous and heterozygous. What's homogeneous mean, guys? Appearance. They appear the same, absolutely. So a glass of milk, is that a pure substance? No, it's a mixture, but it appears homogeneous. It appears uniform, right? It's actually homogenized on purpose. So the fat is suspended with all the other solids and stuff in the water that makes up most of it. Heterogeneous is like the chocolate chip cookie. Remember that way back in the fall? So you've got obvious mixture and a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixtures are also called solutions. They look uniform throughout, even though they're a mixture. Okay? All right, so alloys are homogeneous mixtures and they're important because they give superior qualities uh, to the metals. Pure metals tend to be soft. Not all of them, but most of them. And um, if you want something strong and sturdy, you're gonna mix it with another metal usually to get that strength. One thing that um, 
alloys provide us is corrosion resistance. So oxygen is your enemy when you're a metal. Oxidation on iron has a special name because it's so important. That's rust, of course. But um, corrosion resistance is important. So the stainless steel that you have for your knives, forks, and spoons at home, okay, those are iron primarily, but they throw in some other elements, as you'll hear, um, to make them not rust, not corrode. They also tend to be harder and stronger when you mix the two metals. Changes a lot of the properties, including density. So different sized atoms are going to pack differently. And so you can really change the densities. Alloys tend to be lighter weight. And that's because there's not as much packing that can happen. So chromium and molybdenum together, chromoly, um, it tends to be a very low uh, density. So it's lightweight, whether it's your mountain bike, whether it's wheels on your car, whatever. It makes it um, better. Have you ever seen like cheap bicycles for kids and stuff at Walmart? I can remember, gosh, they're so heavy, these little tiny bikes. And my mountain bike, you know, I can put it on my shoulder and walk around with it, no problem. If it was made, if my kid's bike was that big, I could not do that. You know, so why is that? It's because it's made of an alloy. And so, and they're also stronger, which is good if you're going to be smacking into rocks and stuff. Okay. And then also a really bizarre thing that happens is you can change melting points. So metals have pretty high melting points. Weirdly, when you mix them together, you can really drop the melting point, and that's how we make fuses. Um, and I'll talk about that on Thursday. All right, real quick, watch this. And then show you one last uh, thing about... Uh, the United Airlines airplane. Why is it so important? In this video, we see how different metals bond together to form alloys which still retain the metallic properties of the starting metal, but are usually stronger. Metal atoms are typified by having only a few electrons in their outer shells. This means that even when they bond, there's always room in the valence shell for more electrons. Each metal atom can bond with up to 12 others in the close packed lattice. Look at the red atom, which is surrounded by six in its place and three on top. And two halves and a hexagon. The less compact crystal structures are possible too. For example, this arrangement, where each atom is bonded to eight others. Because seven. there are still not enough electrons to complete the outer shell in the atom, the electrons can move easily from one atom to another, making metals good conductors of both electrons and heat. And because the electrons are not localized in fixed bonds, the atoms can slide past each other, making them ductile, allowing the metal to change. It also means that when you try to react metals together, the atoms normally just mix into the lattice, forming metallic bonds with each other, and there's no fixed proportions randomly distributed. These structures are called alloys. Contrast this with compounds between metals and non-metals, or between non-metallic elements, where the proportions of each element are fixed. The oldest example of an alloy band is the way bronze took over from copper in the early human community of Europe thousands of years ago. During the late Stone Age, axes began to be made of pure copper, but they were fairly soft. When small amounts of tin were added to make bronze, you got an axe which was twice as hard and worked well. Bronze Age had arrived. The atoms in a metal lattice are held by non-directional bonds, a sort of C of these electrons, instead, allowing the atoms to slide past each other and still past making metals relatively easy to melt and bend, but hard to vaporize. When metals change shape, atoms actually slip over each other like this. However, this process does not happen all at once, but bit by bit, rather like trying to move a carpet by putting a rough in it. Here is the way it happens in the metal. You see the slip moving easily one atom at a time, where there's a dislocation in the metal. It is this easy movement of atoms in the crystal lattice that makes most pure metals soft. 
now put a smaller or bigger atom into the latter, and this easy movement to the dislocation is blocked. See the way the bigger atom stabilizes the dislocation, which gets no further unless you put greater force, meaning that it's harder to bend the alloy. To finish, let's look at some well-known alloys. Bronze, three quarters copper, quarter tin, the sculptures, both hardware and screws, brilliant. Brass, 70% copper, 30% zinc, musical instruments, coins, door knocking. Carbon steel, 99% iron and up to 1% carbon for building construction, tools, car bodies, machinery, rails, etc. Stainless steel, iron with about 18% chromium and 8% nickel, used for tableware, cookware, surgical and tools, and so on. Aluminium alloys for claims contain a few percent of copper or other metals. Amalgam is mercury with silver and other metals once used for dental filling. Solder, lead and tin for joining electrical wires or components, not so easy. Gold is usually an alloy containing another metal such as silver for increasing hardness. The number of carats, A, defines how many mass parts of pure gold are found in 24 parts of the alloy. So there's uh, lots more to learn about alloys um, and they have different strengths. I wanted to show you this, but I don't think we're going to have uh, time. Um, there was an airplane, I don't know if you guys saw, um, about the uh, United Airlines <laughs> engine on a 777 that came apart and dropped pieces on a suburb in Denver when they were taken off from Denver International Stapleton to, to go to Hawaii. Um, and uh, uh, it was pretty uh, gosh darn scary. The engine actually lit on fire and people had uh, were taking pictures of it. But the airplane didn't crash. This was just like two weeks ago. Airplane didn't crash because even though it failed, one of the engines, one of the two engines that it has failed, regulations require that the, en the airplane be able to fly with one engine. So what happened in this uh, jet is the one of the fan blades broke off. My dad was, and I were talking about it on uh, Sunday when we uh, called them. Those blades, those, uh, there's like 40 something blades on the uh, front fan of a 777 engine. They're made of titanium, of an alloy of titanium. They're hollow actually, but they weigh 34, 36 pounds, something like that. They're super heavy because they're super big. So that space is like 100 inches across. So I don't know, you know, seven, eight feet. And um, one of those engine blades broke off at the base um, and shredded things as it went out and then um, ripped out a bunch of wiring, which is probably what caused the fire. But knowing how, checking for stresses in metals has to be done. And we're going to find out more about metallic bonding uh, on uh, Thursday. So uh, you have definitions to do for Hallmark. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. And we'll see you, well, in class people, I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>